in August of last year, I made the bold and admittedly impulsive decision to join the Science Olympiad team. And at the first club meeting, I drowned in a sea of people who were orders of magnitude smarter than I was. And I, for one, was terrified. Soon we received our event placements and I was placed in the hilariously named Designer Jeans. Hysterical. This event was everything gene editing. And I can say that I had no idea what was going on. But as I began to delve a little deeper into the science behind gene editing, I went from lost to absolutely fascinated. I learned that since the discovery of the DNA double helix in 1953, the general consensus has been that these genes are untouchable. But that story is changing. Gene editing technologies, or because I'm lazy, GETS for short, are revolutionizing biology and specifically due to the rise of CRISPR, or clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. We are now well on our way to harnessing the power of genetics. And by doing so, we have the power to solve problems ranging from genetic diseases to the global energy crisis. It's a whole new world of science. So let's explore it by first defining what exactly CRISPR is, then understanding its history before finally, and most importantly, balancing the benefits and the risks of its use. Because if we fail to understand the enormous potential that CRISPR has, it will get nowhere. CRISPR was first observed in nature, where it acts as an immune system for bacteria and their relatives. And it relies on two key parts. First, a molecule called CRISPR-associated protein 9, or Cas9 for short. This protein is special because it can cut DNA, hence the colloquial nickname, molecular scissors. But to function properly, Cas9 must be aided by the CRISPR guide sequences, which act as the system's navigators. These guide sequences contain the genetic information of viruses that the cell recorded during past infections. It attaches to Cas9, and together they scout the cell looking for a DNA match, which would indicate a new infection. If it finds one, the Cas9 quickly cuts up and disables the viral DNA, eliminating the infection. Together, these two molecules form the CRISPR-Cas9 system that lately we've all heard about. And like most things in biology, it looks like a blob. But in 2012, scientists from Cal Berkeley found a way to change CRISPR from a find and destroy tool to a find and replace tool allowing gene editing rather than gene destruction. To do this, a target strand of DNA is identified and an appropriate guide sequence is made. This attaches to Cas9 and the resulting complex is injected into the host cell where it begins to look for a match. And when it does, the Cas9 lives up to its nickname, snipping the target gene. Our bodies will try to heal this cut, but things can go awry. This error process is so error prone that oftentimes the gene in question just gets turned off. But not always. By adding another template protein onto the Cas9 blob, the host cell can be given instructions on how to execute the repair, allowing a defective gene to be repaired or for an entirely new one to be inserted. And this gene editing system works on any gene in any cell in nearly any organism giving it a plethora of possible use cases. But these incredible capabilities haven't been long understood because, we, because the CRISPR puzzle wasn't solved all at once. It was a 33 year long journey to get where we are today. It started back in 1987 when a team of Japanese researchers observed CRISPR for the first time. And three years later, Spanish biologist Francisco Mojica hypothesized that CRISPR serves as a versatile and adaptable immune system for microbes. And in 2006, his theory was supported by French scientist Philippe Horvath. He stitched viral DNA into the CRISPR systems of various bacteria to test their immunity, ultimately proving that CRISPR indeed serves as a versatile and adaptable immune system. And that same year, Dutch biologist John van der Oost was the first to artificially synthesize the guide sequences. This allowed him to protect the cell from any virus, but without prior infection. And in 2012, CRISPR was first used to edit genes rather than destroy them. 
Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuel Charpentier of the University of California at Berkeley discovered trans-activating CRISPR RNA, which is a mouthful, so it's just referred to as tracer RNA. Its job is to, alongside the guide sequences, take the Cas9 to its target. By understanding tracer RNA, the puzzle was completed. The CRISPR RNA discovered by John van der Oost, the tracer RNA found by Charpentier and the knowledge of Cas9's cutting abilities came together to allow us to edit genes. That's kind of a big deal. And ever since that discovery, innovations are flowing in faster than ever. But at this point, you may be wondering, who cares? And that would be logical. It's what I thought at first, too. But CRISPR, though it's decidedly still a work in progress, holds significant promise not only in the lab, but in the world at large, and most prominently in three main areas. First, it can be used to edit the genes in food. A team of Dutch scientists used CRISPR to prevent wheat from producing gluten, making it suitable for, by, suitable for consumption by people with celiac disease. This means that the estimated three million Americans living with celiac disease can now consume wheat via this new alternative. But CRISPR isn't just used for preventing allergic reactions. It can also be used to make food safer. A British company created a CRISPR-edited species of coffee bean that is naturally decaffeinated, meaning it doesn't need post-harvest treatment. Currently, decaf coffee is made by soaking beans in dichloromethane and ethyl acetate, dry cleaning fluid. Needless to say, this new variety is safer. But while those CRISPR beans are being used to give people less energy, the technology is also being used to create more clean energy. A California biotech firm created a CRISPR-edited species of algae whose biofuel production is more than twice the normal rate, making clean biofuels more viable than ever before. But perhaps the most important use of CRISPR is in editing human genes, where it has the most relevance to me personally. Back in July when I was writing this speech, I decided to ask my mom what sort of diseases and disorders run in our family. And um, it's not looking too good. <laughs> it's worth noting that not all of these diseases are genetically influenced or even inherited, but some of the most dangerous ones, such as heart disease, asthma, and predisposition to Alzheimer's disease and certain cancers are. But the CDC tells us that CRISPR could be used to help treat heart disease. Stanford University found a use for it in treating asthma. UPenn proved its use in treating cancer. And Boise State University has found a possible use case for CRISPR in treating Alzheimer's disease. Yay! But I know you're all wondering, can CRISPR treat COVID-19? And the answer is maybe. A team of researchers from Stanford University found that a targeted CRISPR treatment can reduce symptoms in infected patients by up to 90%. So, yeah, CRISPR offers us a crisp, haha, and fresh way of looking at gene editing. But surrounding its use is a whole mountain of ethical questions. Because although recent tests have yielded huge advancements in CRISPR's accuracy, things weren't always so great. A notorious 2015 experiment had a dismal 7.4% success rate. And one in 2017 only succeeded half the time. But in 2018, a team of Chinese scientists achieved a remarkable 89% success rate. Things are looking good for CRISPR. And with new innovations coming in the field faster now than ever, this technology will pop up more and more. But we must remember that in a field of study just eight years young, there is so much that we simply don't and can't know about it. Rome wasn't built in a day, but we are constructing new scientific worlds at an alarming pace, leading osmosis.org to claim that, quote, the scientists have moved quicker than the ethicists. If taken too quickly, gene editing technologies could present an ever-widening ethical dilemma. So let's take our time and let ethics catch up with science, because CRISPR can change the world as we know it, and for the better. 
in many ways, it already is. From university labs to agriculture, and from algae farms to science Olympiad. It's just up to us to try these designer genes on. Thank you.